good morning and welcome to the fifth meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. I remind everyone to turn their mobile phones and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting. Um, today we have received apologies from Ian Gray and from Gordon MacDonald. The first item of business is the, our inquiry into Scottish National Standardised Assessments. Uh, this is the fifth panel of evidence to the inquiry and can I welcome this morning Lindsay Law, convener of Connect, James McAnany, a lecturer and journalist, Darren Northcote, National Officer of Education of the NASUWT, and Susan Quinn, Education Committee convener of the EIS. Very warm well, welcome to you all. Um, the panel uh, should receive from the outside. If you would like to respond to a question, it's a big committee and a big panel, so um, you may not want to contribute to every question that's been asked, but please indicate myself and the clerks will try and pick that up. And for the benefit of those watching, I just want to explain that the committee had an informal meeting with teachers on the topic this morning, which may be raised in formal uh, evidence. And I would like to, again, put on record my thanks to all those who attended the informal session this morning. Um, I'd like to just open by just asking each of you to just briefly outline your experience as it relates to an inquiry. And I'll go to Miss Law first. So I'm the convener of Connect. Um, Connect is a parents group and a registered charity, and we provide support to parents and carers all over Scotland. We have a membership model, so parent councils, PTAs, are members of Connect, and they can access additional services. Um, I've been on the board of Connect since, um, I think, 2016, so three years. Um, and prior to that, I was on the Education Committee as the parental representative for the City of Edinburgh Council, and I've been involved as um, a parent helper or in parent councils since my daughter started nursery school in 2007. Thank you. Ms Quinn? Uh, I'm the Education Convener for the EIS, which is an elected position within the Institute. I am a primary teacher to trade um, and, and a primary head teacher up until um, the last few years. I've been involved in the work around the SNSAs and the wider assessment curriculum work as a member of the Curriculum for Excellence uh, Management Board um, and subsequently the follow-up boards and different groups in relation to that. Thank you. Mr McInerney. Um, so I was a secondary school English teacher. I'm now an FE lecturer. And um, I suppose I'm here because when the policy was first announced, I tried to investigate the origins of it um, through what at that point were some of my first FOI requests um, and spent kind of a year dealing with that and trying to get the information, eventually published it. And since then, I've had an interest in looking at the development of the policy um, and the way it's kind of interacted with issues like uh, government transparency uh, and policy making. Thank you. Mr Northcott. Uh, good morning. My name is Darren Northcott. Um, I'm a primary teacher by background. I'm currently the um, national official for education at the NSWT. We obviously represent members in Scotland who are engaging with the SNSAs directly. Um, we also represent members across the UK. So there's a kind of degree of compare and contrast. There are different approaches elsewhere in the UK that it might be interesting for the committee to consider. And also we're involved internationally. So we have a great deal of experience in how other jurisdictions introduce nationwide and system-wide assessments. So um, there's hopefully something that we can share that's of use to the committee this morning. Thank you. I'm going to move to Les Smith. Uh, thank you, Convener. And, um, I, I'm particularly interested in this issue uh, about what I think is the central dilemma that the committee has been facing about the purpose uh, of the standardised assessment. And we've had, as you know, three evidence sessions prior to this, uh, during which time uh, I think it's been put to us that there is a dilemma because in some cases the, the assessments are being used um, to measure individual performance by the child but at the same time they're being used to have a summative purpose so that schools and local authorities can drill down on where there are issues about uh, underperformance. Now, I'd be very interested in your views both from a professional background um, as to where you think we can go with this uh, dilemma because obviously there is a, 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 an extremely important educational argument that uh, the child and the best interests of that child matter uh, most in, in the assessment. But 
on a national basis, there is obviously this concern that there is some underperformance and whether it is used in that perspective. So I'd be interested in about how you feel we could address that dilemma. Yeah, Ms Quinn. So when, shortly before the, SN, the announcement that the SNSAs would come into play, there was a national discussion about um, how we would gather the information about where education was within Scotland. There had been the um, Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy in place for a number of years, and there was some um, challenge around the, that towards the, the end of its, its existence. Um, part of the work of the, the management board and the wider stakeholders was with the then Cabinet Secretary um, for Education to discuss what was needed in terms of going forward. What was generally agreed within the stakeholders at, at those meetings was that there was a body of evidence within our system which told us everything we needed to know that um, the challenge was how that could be gathered to give you um, as, as elected politicians a national picture that was was going to be um, easily understood or otherwise but there was no real um, feeling within the room that there was any requirement to introduce um, an additional um, test into the system as a, as a national test. Now, what's come forward from that then is some a, an assessment test, whatever we want to call it, because we're, we're at cross purposes around it, um, that has been um, developed and taken account of some of the concerns that certainly the trade unions and parent groups raised at, at the, the start of them, that we didn't want to return to what we had under 5 to 14 and the the national tests there, and that then what we've got is something which actually is trying to do um, all things for all people and, and, and potentially can't. So the SNSA, as it's been developed, uh, seeks to provide some diagnostic information across potentially only about 10% of the curriculum um, base, so it's not providing the, 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 the widest of information to, to schools. But is and and can be used to look at individuals and and groups within within classes. Now, one of the challenges around that then has been how it's been implemented in in local authorities. So, um, had there been a situation where this had been introduced and it had been left to teachers and schools to decide if and when they required to use it to inform their professional judgment, then it it may well have provided a. a, a valid resource in addition to what's already there. Schools, you will have heard, use a broad range of assessments, including a number of standardised tests and assessments for specific purposes. And those will continue regardless of where, what happens with SNSC. In terms of what it provides for a, for a national context, then it's how, re how reliable that can be if we use it to drill down for, for teachers, because it's going to be done at different times in the year, it's going to be done with different groups of young people, different support's going to be provided. So it's not standardised in the, the, the broadest definition, and, and that, then, that then brings its problems. We would suggest that the information that has now been gathered around um, achieving a level that sits within the National Improvement Framework Bank is the kind of evidence that you should be looking at and parents will be interested in because it gives the broadest picture of the young person, not just 10% of their learning across a period of time. And that that in itself is becoming more reliable because I know that that was the question at the time was how reliable that is. That's now becoming more reliable as teachers and schools work together to moderate the information that's there, that they get a better understanding of the uh, benchmarks that have been introduced only in the last year or two. So we've been working with a curriculum and then benchmarks were introduced after the fact. So there's a lot of work needed to be done. That could have been resolved before SNSA was introduced. I would argue that it should have been resolved. Teachers should have been given the time, the training and the space that they needed to better understand the levels and, and the, the standards that were required to make it a more reliable system for you. And then we might not have needed to have gone with this. 
Uh, thank, thank you very much for a very full answer there. Could I just ask uh, Lindsay Law if she feels that parents uh, understand the purpose of these uh, new assessments in the way that informs them about how well their child is doing at school? Do you feel that that purpose is clear? No, that, that purpose isn't clear, partially because although they are described as standardised tests, um, which would imply to parents that they would happen at a certain time and in a certain way. Across each local authority, and in fact across each school, the way they've been described to parents, the way they've been communicated to parents is different. Some parents have told us anecdotally of letters coming home telling them that this is a mandatory test, that they have no option, that they can't withdraw their child from it. And, and that, I think, is partially against a milieu of a dysfunctional and difficult relationship between central government and local authorities. Um, and parents and children are being used as a, as a playing piece in that dysfunctional relationship. And that's not helpful to the individual child in the individual classroom. Just in terms of what parents get from schools now. So there's been a complete cultural change in Scottish education over the last you know, decade. So I was reflecting myself on the reports that my parents would, got, would have got when I was in school because my mum kept them, so I have them. And they're literally you know, lines of maths and a score and English and a good, better, best. Um, whereas my daughter's reports are, especially in primary school, are much more descriptive. They talk about the broad general education. They talk about the outcomes in the curriculum for excellence. They talk about how they're becoming responsible citizens, effective contributors. And those can't be measured once in primary one in a very narrow focus of literacy and numeracy. And what you're doing by suggesting that they can be to parents is that you're confusing parents because it's quite difficult when you go to school and get a report that simply has um, a whole loads of descriptions about outcomes that you're not familiar with. Um, it's difficult for teachers to get parents to a place which is removed from where they were when we were at school, which is simply how are you going, what level are you at, what progress are you making against very easy to understand scores. Now, because of that, what parents and teachers need to do and what we encourage at Connect is to have a conversation. What is the potential of the child? How is the child getting on in school? What can we do across that whole curriculum? And this narrows the focus and somewhat undoes the work that has been done on the assessment and the monitoring of progress and curriculum for excellence. And, and I'll just say finally, when curriculum for excellence was introduced, um, I recall... Um, that we had um, people from the SQA and we had people from the National Parent Forum for Scotland come to the consultative committee with parents. And they said to us, look, it's going to take some time for this to work through the system. It's going to take some time for schools and for teachers to become proficient at assessing where your children are. Now, parents don't have time. For a parent, they have one shot at schooling and their child has one opportunity to meet their potential. And so if these tests, if these standardised assessments are aimed at improving the system over the long term, but at the same time are intended to improve the experience and the outcomes for children in the classroom, at present it's very difficult to see how they'll do either. Thank you. My, my last uh, question, convener. I just think my question might pick up oh, from the other okay. witnesses. Can I, can I just ask you about the comment you made about where you feel there's a dysfunctional relationship between national government and local government? Do you feel, and do any of the other witnesses feel, that that is because they are looking to these tests for different reasons and, and, and a different way of assessing? i just, just respond to that um, briefly. Um, I think your opening statement, you said that one of the purposes of these tests could be to help teachers, in effect, make um, effective uh, teaching and learning decisions about pupils' um, next stages in their learning journey, and then also for the system, if you like, to get information about where it is at a national level, at a local level, and a school level as well. So a kind of, if you like, a formative purpose and a summative purpose with one assessment. And that has never been achieved anywhere. <laughs> so I think there's a prior step 
in terms of analysing this is do we want these assessments to be formative or do we want them to be summative? Because it is difficult for one assessment to achieve both ends. I mean, I was just quite taken by the evidence you received from Education Scotland, where on one page it says that the tests are designed to be used formatively and not as summative assessments. And then on the very next page, it talks about how the assessments have been used to form judgments about the effectiveness of a particular department in a school. So if there's confusion at that strategic level, it's not surprising then that teachers and parents question what is the purpose of this assessment and how should it be used. So formative and summative assessments are completely legitimate policy aims, but we have to be clear about what this assessment is trying to achieve, one or the other, because experience tells us that trying to achieve both is very difficult. Yeah, so that's yeah, yeah. sit, yeah, so um, as various people have said, the, kind of the word confusion keeps on coming up. So I've been sort of, as my sort of view on this is a bit different from other people's because of my interaction with it. Um, but if you look back through, as I did sort of before coming here, through all the sort of material I've dug up in the last kind of three and a half years, and you look at the you know, email chains and documents and policies and everything that's all shifted about all over the place, confusion is the word that sums up everything most effectively, I think. So we have a situation, as you say, where we claim to be trying to have a, 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 a testing system that's going to be performing a, a summative function, which is the thing about ensuring teacher judgment um, is, um, is, sort of, is reliable, is to help to ensure that that's something that we, can, that we can trust, which is a separate debate anyway. But that's a summative assessment we're trying to do there. We're also apparently using them, as you say, for a formative assessment to tell teachers more about each individual child in the class. The notion that you're going to be able to combine those two things with a, with a single assessment is optimistic, I think, at best. Um, and I would agree that actually I'd be surprised if there'd be any evidence to show that it's something that is, is likely to, to be possible. And actually, in trying to do both jobs at once, I think what we're actually probably doing is actually doing neither of them well at all and doing quite a lot, of, potentially doing quite a lot of damage while we're doing that. Um, and it goes back to the origins of it all. There was a testing system that was initially, when it was sort of put forward, was quite clearly conceived as something about national level data. This was going to be a, a, a national measurement because that was what we needed. Um, that was why ultimately um, it has been sort of seen as having incorrectly seen as having replaced the SSLN. You then go from there into right. Well, we'll just use it to inform teacher judgments, and that will be the national picture. And then the tests will be part of that of that teacher judgment as well. But then, when you're confusing the two test purposes, you're also in a position where you're essentially saying. We trust teachers to make these judgments, and we're going to rely on teacher judgment as a national measure of an education system. But somehow we don't trust teachers to make those kind of judgments unless they're using a standardised testing system <laughs> that we think has got two or three different purposes. And it, this goes on all the way through this. Like there's, there's no level of this testing system that I've looked at in the last three and a half years where some screaming contradiction doesn't seem to come out of it. And it leaves me feeling that Ultimately, we're going to be in a, to be honest, we're in a situation now where a lot of people three and a half years ago said we would be, which is a committee sitting and having a discussion about what is a formative assessment, what is a summative assessment, and are we ever going to get any closer to having a, some sort of magical testing system that gives us national data? And actually, even on the point of the, the summative and formative thing, because it, it, it comes up all the time, this confusion over it and the argument that this is some sort of formative testing system. What the, it came up most recently when the Scottish Government, in response to an FOI request, cited two academics as having supported the, um, the policy. And when it turned out they both said, no, that isn't true, the defence was, well, what we thought was that they supported sort of formative assessment methods. So we're really sorry if, if we misquoted them. I actually contacted one of those individuals, who was um, Professor Dylan William, and kind of put the First Minister's response during the First Minister's questions to him. Um, it had actually been for a story, but you know there are some things going on right now making it kind of hard to get stories in the press that aren't to do with Brexit. Um, his response was quite clear that these tests, specifically at primary one, these tests do not provide useful formative information. And anybody who knows anything about education, I think would probably understand why Professor Dylan Williams saying that is, is quite a big deal as well. So we're not going to get any further forward with any of this. Um, and that's before we even get to these ideas about closing attainment gaps and dealing with poverty through the schools 
until we can actually nail down what this testing system is supposed to be about, because we're still no closer to doing that three and a half years after Nicola Sturgeon's judged me on my record speech in Wester Hills. Um, Dr Allen? Hi there. Um, I, I don't wish to, to trade in professors here, but um, when, since, since they've been mentioned uh, and since you know, some very important points have been made about um, the purpose of, uh, of the assessment, um, I was just interested in the, this idea about assessment having more than one purpose, potentially, and we've, we've obviously heard quite some, some evidence on this uh, in previous hearings. Um, Professor Hargreaves has pointed out that uh, there's a general principle that um, many but not all people accept that data that is collected for one purpose should not be used for another, but that does not mean that data should not be collected for two purposes. Mm -hmm. um, my question really is, is about this question that some of you have pointed to, which is about the, the, um, the need and the pressure on local authorities to try to um, close the attainment gap and, and deal with the inequalities that exist very, very early on in a child's life. And I suppose my question is, if it's not this data that you want to be used, what data is it that you'd want to be used as a benchmark for local authorities and others to try to address those problems? Ms Quinn. It, the benchmarks that schools and, and early years establishments have on young people from the very, very early stages, the, the widest possible assessments that go on, are, the young people, um, will have, have assessments that are carried out by health visitors in, into um, their early years establishments and a number of um, approaches that are there that then go on into schools where there are benchmarking um, early intervention strategies put in place from the beginning in primary schools. Um, there will be very few where they won't be assessing the young people's um, point of entry at the point of entry to primary one. They will do that using a whole range of strategies, um, whether it's uh, teachers' observations of the young people at play, whether it's their own formal um, approaches to the assessment that they've had. There will be a whole, whole host of pieces of information about the young people from the very earliest stage to, to see where that's at. And then you get into the fact that at the end of primary one, teachers are making a professional judgment as to whether or not the young person has achieved um, in, in the early level. And that will be based on three years worth of assessing of a young person. It won't be done in a single session assess a single as we as we're generally told single half hour session assessing their literacy and a single half hour session assessing their numeracy it won't give you that information the, in terms of um, closing the attainment gap or, or or otherwise it will always be a position where the teacher's professional judgment and the assessments the informal assessments the informal interactions that happen day and daily between teacher and and pupil, support workers and pupils, parents and teachers, and, and, and everybody that's involved with the young person will provide that data, which will then allow us to see whether or not the young person is achieving the level at the appropriate point in time at the end of primary one, primary four, and so on. And then taking into that um, any other specific diagnostic assessments that are are identified as potentially being helpful to an individual young person because there's a conversation about whether or not they have additional support needs or otherwise. These assessments won't, won't identify whether a young person has got additional support needs or not, won't do it. It will require other assessments to take place and those will only take place if there is a really broad basis for, for assessment. So, if you're saying, are these assessments going to be the benchmark by which you determine whether or not the, the additional money for PEF has had, has had its impact, then no, this, these, these single half hour, whatever time it takes them to do assessments, won't do it. It will be the broad assessment bank that goes on in schools day and daily, and the conversations between head teachers and their teachers about whether or not the young people are achieving the level based on the benchmarks that have now been introduced and the E's and O's that they've been planning around. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to bring Miss Law in and then I'll come back to Dr. Harlan. Um, 
So I think there is confusion from parents over the diagnostic nature of the test. So parents might expect that they might get a, di a, di um, a diagnosis of dyslexia or something else that might need um, additional support. So that was just my first point, that there is confusion over that. But my second point, just in, in regards to gathering data and closing the attainment gap, is that we don't, when young people leave school, we don't talk about their literacy and numeracy. We talk about positive destinations. We talk talk about the people that they have become. And actually schools are becoming much more creative and much more broad in their understanding of the broad general education and the curriculum. You know, they're, they're undertaking um, work with colleges, work with local enterprises, bringing the community into the school, taking the school out into the community, all to drive positive destinations for our young people, which may or may not be academic when they leave school. And by focusing at each stage on a very narrow focus of literacy and numeracy, you really are detracting from the message that you sent to the people of Scotland about that broad general education and what the Curriculum for Excellence was supposed to attain. And my concern would be that some of that really great work that's being done in schools on those positive destinations will be... Um, that attention will be drawn away by the pressure that they get from local authorities, by the pressure that they get from official or unofficial league tables which would spring up off the back of this data, from a very narrow focus on literacy and numeracy, which is exactly what the Curriculum for Excellence was supposed to draw us away from and focus on the whole child, the whole young person, and how they move forward to be effective and um, happy, responsible citizens. Okay. Um, Dr. Allen? Yeah, just uh, on the back of that, I, mean, I absolutely accept uh, what Ms. Quinn is saying there about the importance of the conversations that are taking place throughout a, a child's school career between parents and the local authority and uh, the other sources of information that exist. I suppose my, my question is really, um, does that provide data which would be usable for local authorities to make policy interventions? Um, because I appreciate we're talking about two things at once here. We're talking about interventions in the life of a child, but also policy interventions. So do those kind of conversations, in your view, I don't know the answer to this, do they provide the kind of information that would allow local authorities to make policy interventions? They, they should be able to, and certainly um, with, with schools talking more outwardly to, to each other and, and across local authorities and the like. So the information that's there would be around um, you know, those conversations about what kinds of interventions um, a particular school has, has been developing, whether that's made a, made a difference to the achieving a level um, data that they have in the, in its, with, its broadest, with its broadest sense, considering whether or not those interventions are something which might be um, transferable elsewhere with an acceptance and an understanding that education isn't one size fits all and that you have to look at the context and the, and the determination about it but, but I'm absolutely clear that if the conversations are going on properly if the time and space is there to do that um, and then this kind of evidence which is based on much more than a very narrow approach to um, to to the to the the, the standardised assessments, and, and note that the the information around the standardised assessment that's been gathered nationally is to consider whether or not there are there are norms around around particular areas. It's not. It's only going to tell you about ten percent of the curriculum in a point in time that that's so very different. And we haven't got common approaches to things across the country because the country isn't a common space in terms of what will work in one place and what will work in another. So the, using the wider educational information, I believe, does already and has done in the past made a difference to local policy. I've sat in Glasgow City Council's assessment curriculum group on a number of occasions over the years, and we use the information that comes from our schools based on the information that head teachers are telling us to, to drive policy at local level. Mr. Northcote, yeah. just, just briefly to return to your um, first question around whether there is a need for national and local authority, national bodies, local bodies to have um, data and educational performance, I'd say yes, there absolutely is, because they're public bodies 
Um, they're run by democratically accountable um, and elected people, and therefore there is a need for them to have good information in order to make national and local policy. I think the issue is, is that if you try and make that policy on the basis of a very narrow range of indicators or a single indicator, I think the, the problem is, is that you may not make um, the best policy. So a national assessment may have a role to play in that, as long as you're clear that that's the role it has. But I think it's also important, as we've heard, to make sure there are other sources of data and information as well. And I would just add that it's not just about assessments. I think inspection has a really important role to play in giving policymakers at a national and a local level um, some understanding of the progress that's being made in the education system, the impact of interventions generally and on different groups, and what policy, um, in, uh, I suppose, uh, implementation needs to be taken forward in order to address any problems that are identified. So it's about having a range of good quality information and data on which to base policy decisions, not simply to focus on one standardised assessment across the system, although that may have a small part to play, but we need to put it in perspective in that sense. Yeah. Again, okay, so the two points. Um, one is going back to that first thing about um, having national level and, and council level data. Um, we did have something that gave us national level data, which was the SSLN, and um, it didn't break down to council level, but the, uh, if I remember, I can't remember the name of the paper, assessment and transition. Um, it was a paper which was um, done by Glasgow University and it looked at all sorts of different things, but one of the recommendations or the ideas in there was we could expand the SSLN to perhaps include local authority level breakdowns, which would have been an idea that would have been worth looking at that could have taken us some way to having this national picture that we could also have looked at in a more sort of localised fashion without ever needing to go down to how can we get school level data about every single school because the the potential problems that that create may well, may very well, may likely outweigh any benefits that you would get from it. The other thing is, um, so the point Susan was making about this thing about, and it kept coming up at the, the informal session as well, this thing about time and space. So there seems to be this idea that by introducing this test, some, some bit of data is going to arrive, which is then going to allow, as you say, sort of a, a council or a government to make policy interventions, which is going to allow, this bit of data is going to let us go and do this thing, which will make things better. Um, so, so firstly, as people have said, it, it simply isn't going to be able to do that. And there's, there's no point kidding ourselves on that these kind of tests will. In order to get that kind of information and to create those kind of improvements and to have a system where we can actually achieve that sort of progress, time and space is the key thing. You need to have a system uh, where professionals are able to be professionals with the sorts of discussions that are being mentioned there. There's actually time and space for them to happen and not just happen at council levels, but happen at school levels and then across local authority levels and then across national levels. And I know that it's not a, a hugely um, convenient thing that that, that there just isn't a, a single way to do it. There isn't a straight, easy answer. There isn't a quick answer to that. The only way to get that kind of information and to have it reliable enough to make it worth acting on and to get a situation where we could start to, as we say, sort of transferring a useful intervention in one place and deciding, well, that might work somewhere else and maybe transferring it over and trying it. It is a necessarily, I think, slow and careful process as opposed to one where we focus on getting data quickly and finding a, a use for it or telling ourselves we've got a use for it because we're in a position where we, f we feel we need to be seen to be doing something. I think that's, there's a big, I think there's a, there's a lot of damage is done a lot of the time by that constant need to be seen to be active rather than carefully working through the kind of slow processes that people at every level of education keep consistently saying are the key thing that we need to focus on. And the, therefore, the risk with the SNSA debate, or the national testing debate, is that the more time we spend on that, the more time, frankly, we spend in chambers like this having this kind of conversation, the less time we're spending doing the things that we should be doing that are actually going to make, that could potentially make some sort of difference to addressing the impacts of poverty in schools, although that itself, I would argue, is also a, an issue that we don't really understand very well. Thank you. Um, Ms. Yeah. I just want to pick up this point from um, Lindsay Law about literacy and numeracy and, and broad education. And I, I understand that you know you don't want to focus entirely on a very narrow set of assessment, but isn't it not reasonable to say 
that one of the things schools need to be doing is to give children the building blocks in order to access broader education and that in fact dis being disadvantaged in terms of literacy and numeracy from early on then feeds its way through exactly to the point where your um what your positive destination is going to be and some of them are not very positive at all so i wonder how do we get that balance right because you know i was a teacher in the late 70s early 80s and there was a bit of a thing about we don't need any of that rigor we just you know you learn through reading or whatever it might be how do you address that question that it is a fundamental means of opening up access to education to be able to be confident in your uh, reading and, and mathematical skills? So I don't think um, Lindsay was suggesting that we didn't have a focus on literacy and numeracy and literacy and numeracy and health and wellbeing are the are at the, the core of what we're doing across BGE and across and, and the, the transformational work that's been done in relation to these areas um, as a result of the development of curriculum for excellence is, is there for people to see within schools. However, by focusing a, a, a national test on these two areas draws away from much of the other work that's going on in schools. Lindsay will speak for herself, I'm sure, if I'm... If I'm misrepresenting what she's saying. So the fact is that this, these tests won't make sure that there's any more rigour in terms of the work in literacy and numeracy than, than before. They won't, that, that these, these tests won't do that. The rigour is there. The work is ongoing. The transformational work around um, dealing, looking at literacy and numeracy, and particularly at the early stages, and the development of play-based pedagogy in terms of developing literacy and numeracy and tackling the issues around um, the gaps in learning that young people come to school with are, 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 are there to be seen in our schools. All you need to do is go and visit them on a regular basis and, you, and you'll, you'll get sight of them. You will get information on the impact of that through the work and through the assessments and the discussions around achieving a level the standardised national assessments will give you no more than that. That's what our teachers are telling us. The, in the first year of using them, that even where people say either okay, they tell us it has told me nothing much more than I already knew about the young people in my class. So if they're telling you nothing much more than you already knew, why waste time doing them? Why not use your time to teach the kids and go on with the rest of the rest of the bits because if you're if you're assessing you're not teaching and even if you're saying they're only taking half an hour they're not because the way they're having to be the way they're having to be worked on teachers are having to take their time away from addressing the teaching needs for the whole class to work with a couple of people on a on a computer because there's not the infrastructure there or otherwise so there are all sorts of reasons why if this information isn't adding giving added value to the system that's already in place then it's not worth doing. It's not that literacy and numeracy aren't, aren't the focus. They absolutely are the focus for it. But I would, I would uh, echo Lindsay's point, which is we focus too much on narrow bits of what we're doing within the education system. One of the ways you will, you will know whether or not the interventions that are happening at, at, at the early stage are working are looking at the, the um, destinations of our young people. If we continue to improve on the positive destinations and the positive experiences there, then that will show that we are making a difference all the way through the system. Now, there has to be some rigour around what's, what's put in place to make sure that no, no, no child has been uh, missed out in terms of the work that's there. But actually, um, literacy and numeracy are at the core of what we're doing. It's just that... There are many things more that we could be looking at and um, promoting in terms of our education system than just what, what the literacy and numeracy scores are at P1 or P4. Mr Northcote. Just again, briefly, I mean, literacy and numeracy are foundational. I think, you know, uh, that has to be recognised. I think one of your one of your many professors who's given evidence said that although the areas of assessment for SNSAs are narrow, they're quite important. And, and that has to be recognised. I don't think there is a challenge to 
policymakers at national or local level having a particular interest in literacy and numeracy. I think that's legitimate. The problem comes when that is all that you end up focusing on. And I have to say, if you take, for example, um, experience from south of the border, that has been a serious shortcoming in the education system that even the National Inspectorate, Ofsted, now recognises that there has been a disproportionate emphasis on literacy and numeracy to the detriment of the rest of the curriculum. So the inspection system in England is being recalibrated to say it's not just about a narrow range of literacy and numeracy um, indicators, it's trying to get a broader balance. And so in a context of, of national policy here, I think it's fine to have a particular focus on literacy and numeracy, understanding also that the SNSAs were supposed to be part of a broader assessment focused on CFE levels. And also I'd add that point about the critical role to be played by inspectors as well. So inspectors are able to go into schools and form a judgment about the holistic nature of the education being provided. That balance is difficult um, to achieve. It, it is, and it takes, I think, to some extent, this is an iterative process. We're in the early days of the SN SNSAs, and I think we have to work through some of these issues. But it's about getting that balance right. The key trap to avoid is that you end up focusing in a, in a punitively high-stakes way on a very narrow range of indicators, because that will impact upon the breadth and balance of the curriculum that children experience. Okay. Okay, that's, yeah, so, um, this thing about becoming far too focused on these very narrow indicators, as you say, that you would expect people to have a focus on literacy, and numeracy, and health and wellbeing as foundational aspects of education. But it is very, very clear, and in Scotland, it's very clear actually that we're going in the wrong direction on it as well compared to some other countries with this really, really extreme focus on a relatively small number of things that we're going to we're going to try and target or that are going to form our, our data points. And it happens for various reasons. Governments need good news stories. Oppositions need things to, to batter them with in the press and stuff like that. And journalists want stories that can go out the next day and everything. And, um, and it's hugely frustrating. And as somebody who writes in the Scottish media about education, it is massively frustrating for people like me as well. It's incredibly difficult to actually have the, the full discussion that we need to have about these kinds of issues. Um, but I think I worry that increasingly, and certainly over the last few years, Scotland is moving very obviously in the wrong direction on that. We're doing more and more of it. And I say there are political media reasons, there are issues that are to do with the, the, the devolutionary structures of the Scottish Parliament that, that feed into all of that. But if one of the good things that comes from this is a recognition across the whole chamber, across, beyond that, across the whole society, that actually we are making a mistake with the way that we are becoming far too focused on really narrow, atomised aspects of the education system, then that would at least be something to come out of all this. It would at least get us, it would take us from a, a direction of travel right now, which, as somebody who teaches in the education system, writes about it, and as a four-year-old son, worries me with the direction that we're going just now. So, but as I say, if, if a consequence of all of this, of, of these various mistakes and all this confusion, is maybe a discussion about actually stopping that, just putting the brakes on a bit and, you know, actually thinking through the direction we want to go in, maybe that would be a positive to come out of it. Um, yeah, I'll bring in Rona Mackay. Do you want to go to your yes, just a question? From what, what you were saying, Mr McInerney, I'm just wondering if we're in danger of overcomplicating this in terms of... Susan Quinn has said this is one of a broad range of uh, assessments that are made. So I'm just not sure why it's so... Um, yeah, exactly. There are a couple of... I suppose there are a few reasons for that. Um, one of them is there's a sort of principled thing of, on the one hand, saying that we trust teacher judgment to be the metric by which we measure an education system, but at the same time saying effectively, whether it's explicit or not, that we're only really going to trust it if it's based on a set of standardised tests that we've decided as a, as a government that we want. I mean, I, you know, that's, that's going to get a reaction, I'm afraid. But the other thing, which is the point that's been t touched on already and was mentioned several times in uh, the informal session, there is an opportunity cost to not just these tests themselves, but to the, the culture that they are likely to, to lead into. And it ultimately probably it almost certainly ends in standardized test data versions of it becoming public we've heard about schools sending out 
SNSA reports to parents and things like that. So part of the reason that there's a lot of concern around this is because it, or I think, is because it represents something of a direction of travel in and of itself. And in other countries that have gone down this kind of road a few years before us, the tests themselves have had an impact well beyond what they've ever intended to do. But it's an impact that was always relative, it's certainly at this stage is now relatively predictable. So direct people towards things like NAPLAN in Australia. So I think when you see a lot of um, comment on this, particularly coming out of the, the teaching profession, I, I think a lot mostly it is coming from that. There is this genuine concern that actually there comes a point when a real focus on, you know, we are going to introduce this kind of testing and this kind of testing will tell us things. It's not just whether or not it might give you a bit of information that may be positive or negative, but there's a, once you start factoring in things like the opportunity cost of it all, there's potentially more damage that's down the line as well. I think that's the thing that maybe that needs to be borne in mind with a lot of it beyond the simple, because your basic point is correct that it's a, 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 it's a single assessment and we do lots and lots of assessment, but there's a particular effect of this kind of system and the way this kind of system has been instituted as well. And I think it would be... Portrayed, portrayed in the media. Is Potentially. I mean, you, you could argue that, yeah. But um, ultimately, you know, if, if you're going to have a, a, a politician sort of stand up and give a big speech about judge me on my record and try and tie educational improvement to electoral cycles, um, I think you maybe need to take that as the starting point for how things then start showing up in the media. You know, a room full of journalists... To took fair, a first minister I, out of word, I suppose, in that in that kind of yeah, sense. To be fair, I don't think the first minister was saying, "Judge me on the record of SNSE." No, it was on the rec was... this record of educational improvement, uh -huh. but in the same speech saying, "I'm going to introduce standardised tests." I mean, what do you think is going to happen? Um, I appreciate it's not intentional, but I think there's a, I think a lot of where we are just now is where we were always going to be, um, as a result of a lot of the things that happened early on in the process, which is unfortunate. Yes, law. I think what, why is there such a big deal? Because resources are, are limited and resources that are placed here are not placed somewhere else in the system. And what we've heard from parents... What, what do you mean by resources in terms of teachers' time? or I, I mean in terms of money, in terms of teachers' time, in terms of um, ev everything. We, we're in a finite system. If, if this is being introduced, then this costs something that is not going elsewhere. And, and, and parents are already having these conversations. Schools already are tracking um, the young people in their schools. You know, at my parent council at high school, now my children are at high school, we've sat down with the head teacher and we've looked at the performance of each year group. We've looked at the virtual comparators. We've looked at the comparators with the local authority. That data exists at the school level. The, the tension is between whether it exists at school and local authority level and whether you can gather it at national level. And that is not a tension that should be played out in children's lives. You know, primary ones, are they're just arrived at school. We know what the data will tell you there. It will tell you that children from a lower socioeconomic background will not be as advanced as children from a higher socioeconomic background. It won't help teachers get anything out of that or parents get anything out of that that they don't already know and and what what we encourage at connect and what we should all be encouraging are good quality conversations between teachers as the primary um, route by which the education system is delivered to children and to parents as the primary supporter of that we know that parents and their engagement makes a massive difference to young people's outcomes <coughs> The way parents get involved in school is not to receive a report with quite dense and complicated information in it that tells you about a point in time snapshot of a small part of the curriculum. It's to have good quality conversations with teachers about the young person in the context of the classroom and how the parent can support that. And that requires investment, it requires smaller class sizes, it requires all the things that the background of austerity is stopping us from having. It means parent councils are no longer supporting value add to a school, they're now providing basic infrastructure and basic needs for a school. It means that teachers are no longer being able to have the time to spend looking at a personal learning plan for a child, but instead will be more focused 
on ensuring that their school doesn't come at the bottom or the middle of a league table that will be prepared from a very narrow focus of the curriculum. We need to think about the young people. How will this affect their classroom learning and what can we do to change that? And I don't think this will do it in the short term and I'm not convinced it will do it in the long term. So how, how do you advocate that we assess children? No, no tests, no assessments? School, sorry. sorry. We've, already, we've, already, we've already told you that there are assessments go on. Uh -huh. yeah, uh, sorry, can I just, can I just respond uh -huh. to that? Yeah. I think uh -huh. in the evidence I just gave you, I explained that from my understanding and from parents' understanding, children are assessed constantly by teachers. Okay. They're assessed through local authority standardised okay. tests. They were assessed through the SSLN. They're assessed constantly throughout the course of their school career and in fact when you come to high school you might argue that they're assessed too much to take away from teaching time because there's a continued focus on numbers rather than individuals as children and that is driven by a national government obsession with being able to say that Scotland is leading the world in x y or z Parents don't care about Scotland leading the world. Parents care about their child's education, what it means today, tomorrow, and the next day. And if you test a primary one today, you're going to have to wait for seven years for that to work through the system until you can get anything meaningful out of it that will help the next cohort coming through. And our children do not have that time. They need resources now, in the classroom now, to help them now. Yep, From my point of view, the introduction of a, a, a national standardised um, test, as we've seen in the past, makes us lazy in terms of our um, conversations about education, attainment and achievement. When we had a uh, five to 14 tests, that's all we talked about was the number, the percentages. I, I remember having these conversations as a class teacher. How can you get that your class to be at 80% when it's at 79%? Not what's the added value that's going to go in there for this young person? How are we going to get to that percentage point? Because a test is a lazy way to report. It's an easy way because you can make graphs and all sorts of pretty pictures out of it but it's a lazy way to report what happens in our system as a whole assessments happen every minute of every engagement that teachers are having with young people if as a teacher you're seeing that something isn't working you're immediately looking to the next step of it it doesn't require a test a formal a test for you to make your decision to change how you're going to work with that young person or that group of young people. But what it does do by introducing something which is um, described as a standardised national assessment or test makes us as a country lazy about how we approach things because it's easy for the journalists to get the information and create the league tables. It's easy for you in Parliament to say, oh, look at that, the SSLN has gone dropped down by 0.06%, so you must be failing as a government and everything's, everything's wrong there. It makes us lazy to focus on an individual thing, but when you put a standardised national test in place, that's what happens. That's where the focus gets directed because it's easy to do it rather than have the complicated conversations, which are the ones which are meaningful that have happened in the th every year in the 30 years that I've been teaching between parents and, and teachers about what's going on with their young person. But it creates a narrative around the system which becomes negative, which takes, takes us away from actually the good work that's going in, on in our classes. Okay, Mr Northcote. Again, just to come back to your point, I don't, I don't think there is a problem with having some kind of national form of assessment. I think that is legitimate. I think the issue is the purposes to which the outcomes of that assessment are put. That is the issue. And I think to give some credit to the Scottish Government, their evidence to this committee makes clear that they recognise there are dangers in high stakes assessment. There are dangers in narrowing the curriculum. And we've seen the damage that's done elsewhere. The trick here is to make sure that we, if we have a national system of assessment, we understand its limitations, 
we understand what it tells us, we absolutely understand what it doesn't tell us, and then we act accordingly. So we put, in a, uh, I guess, a proportionate amount of weight on what I think the, the assessment can tell us. The danger we have here, given some of the kind of evidence that we've heard, is that that message isn't getting through and that people are attaching high stakes purposes to the assessment. So if there's one kind of recommendation I would make to the Scottish Government is to double down on its commitment that this is not a high stakes assessment and they don't want to see teaching to the test. That's a really important commitment that's been given and it has to be um, put into practice. Consistently said is not high stakes. And they need to continue to do that. Yes, yes absolutely. Thank you. Um, Mr. Greer. You know, to stick with this point around um, confusion over purpose, I was quite interested in the, the EIS uh, Britain uh, submission to the committee uh, around the, the union's success initially and the discussions before SNSAs were, were implemented in tr shifting the government's position. The government started off very much from uh, uh, with the, the understanding that the purpose here was, was uh, summative and, and you managed to shift that. Do you believe that the confusion has come because the government has shifted from having one relatively clear position to another relatively clear position, and it's in that shift that this information has not cascaded down properly, or are they still hedging their bets? Is, is the confusion because they're still sitting somewhere in the middle, or is it because the position changed, and inevitably, during that change, it has not transferred down to local authority and to school level consistently? So the, the confusion will be for the individual who is confused <laughs> um, will be what, what their reason is around that. Some of the, the confusion is because that whilst we believe that the, the actual advice um, that has been developed um, within, the, within the groups around this for, for local authorities for the implementation of it, a significant number have chosen not to follow that, that advice. Um, I can't speak to why um, they would do so. Um, I can surmise that it's a whole host of reasons. I know from the previous evidence, it's partly to do with the fact that they, um, they had systems in place that they were happy with. And as I go back to my very opening comments, at the beginning of this process, there was no stakeholder within the system speaking to the then Cabinet Secretary saying, we needed to add any other form of assessment into the system. All we needed to do was look at how we gathered that to get a national picture. So lots of local authorities are, were, were not on board with the, the standardised assessments coming in. So whether they'd come in the way that um, was originally designed or where they have now found themselves to, they were never going to approach them in that particular way. That then gets a confusion for how you relay that to, to parents and, and how you share that information about it. I think that throughout the process of negotiation um, and development of the, um, the, the standardised assessments and the policies that went around that, the advice notes that went around that. There were still mixed messages coming out of Parliament in relation to the purpose of these assessments. Um, and, you know, so I had members saying to, you know, uh, uh, as education convener, we have council five times a year. I'm on my feet talking education for, on average, an hour five times a year. And a substantial part of that time in the last two years has been about me members saying to me, you told us these were going to be this or you said that they weren't going to be that and now they are and they're whatever because the messages coming out continued to be mixed around. Why that is, I don't know. Um, one part of, one part of um, government talking to other parts of government or, or otherwise or, or a desire for the message to be something that it had eventually been negotiated to, to not being. If they had been implemented in the manner which the advice note um, and the, the details that were, were eventually developed, I don't believe we would be here in the same way as we were because teachers and schools would be deciding if and when these assessments were going to be of support to them 
in relation to the work that they were already doing. So you would decide that there would be a, a benefit to the diagnostic um, part of it for a group of young people, but actually your all, own evidence already supported that, that a group had achieved a level and didn't require something else to be put in. But because we had this little bit of it, which was they were going to gather some information from it nationally to get um, trends in it, it was everybody's got to do it and then it becomes, well, how are we going to put that in place? Yes, yeah, so you sort of asked, um, is the problem that we've gone from kind of one relatively clear position to a different relatively clear position? I think I'd probably take issue with the idea that we've reached a relatively clear position now. Uh, so you know, we're still in a situation where we've got tests that are meant to be formative and summative and individual and local and national and we've got all sorts of different versions of of, of which that information is kind of being being dealt with so I, I don't think actually even that is quite the explanation um in terms of the one of the things that's kind of coming up as well is this idea of you know had they been implemented a certain way or had had x y or z happened then things wouldn't have been so bad and i suppose that's the sort of um it's like the unintended consequences defence, I suppose. You know, like we didn't intend for this testing system to be to to become this this kind of beast, and I I have some sympathy for that, but it's limited by the fact that I don't know that claiming the unintended consequence is as strong as it could be given, or as strong as it would be, were it not for the fact that a lot of these apparently unintended consequences were also predicted at the start. Um, and I think that's something that has to be kind of taken into account as well. Like, yes, a lot of this has come from the confusion, a lot of this has come from poor implementation, but a lot of this is actually kind of what a lot of people said from day one was going to happen. We are where, in, in, in so many ways, we are where we thought we'd be. We are where the EIS said we would end up. We are where Connect said we would end up. This is, this, this committee session today the fact that we are here, the fact that I'm here instead of in a college teaching, this is rather an indictment of the fact that the things that were said from the start, which were true, were never, weren't really listened to, it would appear. So we've ended up in this situation and spending this time in here today. I'm interested in why you think the, the government's position shifted or, or perhaps maybe became more confused or however you might want to characterise it. Um, if we're to assume that the, end, the tests were not the end goal in themselves. The, the government must have come at this uh, with another end goal in mind. Uh, with one particular end goal in mind, that takes you in the direction of summative uh, testing. But if you have a different end goal, that would take you in a direction of, of more diagnostic and, and formative testing. Uh, and yet, they seem to have embarked upon a path where midway through this process, the position changed. From your experience of, of engaging with them, or, or James, and your experience of, of investigating this, uh, after the fact, why do you think their position changed? Because it seems that to, to change the potential purpose and the, the design of the test so much fundamentally shifts the overall objective. But they must have started with an objective. Well, I would argue that the, 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 the key, one of the key drivers would have been that the EIS indicated that we would ballot our members to, to boycott any yeah. system of any system of tests that were put in that were going to be. The, the way that they were described in the outset, that it, you know, we, we were clear, we had very quickly had our members behind us in relation to the idea of a single window for every single child in the country being tested at a particular point in time with a single test. We, that would have, we would have trade union um, thresholds, we would have smashed it in our primary sector in particular in relation to this. So we would argue that that was that was a significant driver to to the the negotiations that then took place to allow us to get to a situation now the fact that um we didn't we were unable to shift it from a position that this overarching data was still going to be gathered nationally to look at trends and i'm still not really quite clear how that's going to work because it can't work in year one or two anyway because it's its trends are more than more than a single year's worth of, of data. It means that you have assessments, tests, which are trying to, to meet an, a multiple of masters. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Scott. Uh, thank you. I wonder if the panel might want to uh, 
clarify whether they believe that government of whichever political persuasion genuinely needs to have some data about what is happening in schools? Yes, absolutely, and so it's there. Would, so what would be the best way to achieve that? So the best way to achieve it is what you have currently in place, which is that the, the, the levels are um, across each school are gathered. Um, at, you but know, we're told things. that data is unreliable. Well, and that, that data is, well, again, then, they, so you have to, that data will become no more reliable with, with these tests in it. It becomes no more reliable I'm not with asking, them. In fairness, Ms. Quinn, I'm not asking that. No, asking absolutely. You. But that, that data is becoming more reliable. There are ways and means in which that, and that was the conversations we had back at the start, was how can we make sure that the data we have in the system is more reliable which, than it is. Which uh, year do you think we'll be able to compare ACL data year on year to understand what's happening in our schools then? Which? Year. When? Oh, I don't know. You'll need to have a conversation with, um, with, with Education Scotland and, and the directors of education in relation to that. Okay. I believe that our teachers are working hard within schools and are doing um, incredible work I'm not to, that's to not, moderate. I'm, that's not what well, I'm if you, I'm if you let to, me... No, no, but wait a minute, wait a minute. We're trying to establish, I'm trying to establish what data government of any political persuasion needs to understand what's happening. And therefore, I'm asking when, in the EIS's view, and I'm very open to suggestions from the other panel as well, when we'll actually have that information. I, I believe that the data that's in the system at this point in time is reliable. I believe that it's but there. That's, not, that's absolutely not the evidence this committee's had. Well, again, I can't comment on how, where other people think it's unreliable, but at this point in time, we see an increasing number of systems in place to, to make sure that the, system, the, the data that's in the system from teachers' professional judgment is more and more reliable. Teachers are engaged in more moderation exercises. The benchmarks are now in place. The benchmarks weren't brought forward by Education Scotland until a couple of years ago, so teachers were working blind around certain parts of it, and that was again asked of them, and they continued to work to make sure that the best of evidence was there. So I, I put it back to, to, to those groups as to why they believe that evidence is not reliable when it is based on the broadest of information, and we now have systems in place where teachers, head teachers, deputies, QIOs, Education Scotland are working not just across and within individual schools, but across a, across a multiple well, of schools, across you. local thank authorities. You. Thank you. I believe the system well, is reliable now. But thank you. But I think it's the government who are telling us it's unreliable. It's the government's own assessment. So I, you know, I think that's all the only, the only committee can 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 possibly assess. Um, I wonder, um, Mr. McEnany, if I could ask you. Um, about the specific points you make in your submission about the SSLN. You've already mentioned uh, the potential to expand that. If that was expanded, and you might want to elaborate as to how that best could work, what would, again, what could that tell policymakers, whether they be journalists, um, national policymakers, or indeed government? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm always nervous, says the journalist. I'm always nervous about what, you know, what it could tell journalists, kind of thing, that, that kind of data. The, the advantage of, a national, of national data for governments that is something much more like the SSLN is that because it is sample-based, you don't go down the road of having issues around teaching to the test. I don't know, I know there are a couple of people who were teachers on the, on the, here and here today. I don't know if any of them ever it did the SSLN, um, but I did when I was teaching in, in secondary schools. You couldn't teach to the SSLN. The data it gave was not just reliable in the sense of giving a national snapshot but actually and i don't know if any of the committee members have, i mean if you haven't go back and look at the 2016 sSLN report it, it, the, the level of data in it is remarkable at points and not just the report go back and look at things like the statistical tables that show you things like 2016 one that showed something like 26 percent of what well, i say something like it was 26 percent of kids in primary four or something like that reported that nobody ever read to them at home you know, I mean, that's national data that, that you need. And the SSLN gave us a wealth of it. And the SSLN, for the record, is, is still technically available. The material yeah. for it is still sitting there. So on the one hand, I would say the SSLN and that sort of idea of a national sample is really, really valuable. And I don't think a case was ever made for getting rid of it. I think ultimately it was gotten rid of because if you're going to institute a a system of standard, national standardised testing, it looks very difficult to justify also doing a national sample model, sure. especially if you're making sure. the case to say we need the standardised test system because there's something wrong with a, with a sample model. On the point of, I think, I think I know what you're getting at on the thing with the teacher judgment. 
and the question of whether or not individual teacher judgment of their pupils is reliable, but it's, a, it's actually a two-part question I think you're asking. Can you trust teachers' judgment in terms of the progress their pupils are making? To which the answer is absolutely yes. I'll trust a teacher every day of the week before I trust, trust a standardised test. I've got my wee boys, four, got primary school next year. I'm not interested in seeing a standardised standardise assessment report about how he did in 40 minutes one day. But I'd love to be able to sit with his teacher for an hour mm. a couple of times throughout the course of the year. The issue comes, I suppose, where, about whether or not you can use that at a national level to give you the same kind of thing that the SSLN did. In my view, would be that no, those are two very different things. And given the point we've made earlier on about trying to, ha trying to be clear what ass assessment's for, what data's for, mm. I think those are two different kinds of things, which is not to say I don't trust teacher judgment data. It's not to say that achievement of a level data is not useful or accurate. I do think there are issues with things like, so we've heard that teachers are doing more and more moderation around what those levels look like, which is true, but I think we're still a long way from where we would want to be with the time available for doing that. Mm -hmm. I remain unconvinced that the, that sort of, for want of a better term, that standards um, have yet been properly exemplified. Um, which is something that comes up quite a lot uh, when you sort of discuss aspects yeah. of coming to judgments across more than one and area. Could you just help so, me with the other point you make on that, where you say in your submission that no properly agreed standard of what the achievement of a level looks like? Yeah. yeah what, so, do you, what do you mean by that? I think the thing is, if you look at like, um, if you go back and look at, in fact, did I open it up here? If you go back and look at the SSLN, there's like a very clear statement made of like, this is what, um, you know, performing very well looks like. Um, or this is what someone's struggling looks like. Yeah. There's data given to kind of around that. I still don't think there's a what's ever been achieved is you know a, a clear a clear cut. You know this is what a, a level three writing assessment looks like. But I would add, and I think I perhaps wasn't clear about this in the submission, that part of the reason for that is that. That's not really what that kind of yeah, information is indeed. particularly for. I don't think it's necessarily very helpful to, yeah. to try and view level three writing as there is a thing and that's what it's, it's going to be. But, that's, but it's still the case that I think we are a long way from having a situation where teachers actually have the time and the space and the professional autonomy and the trust from government and from parliament and from journalists, I would, I would happily say as well, to actually do that proper moderation job um, that I think would lead to, as much as I trust the judgment and teachers trust it, that I think might lead to, to go to your original point where the government was saying it couldn't trust it. Well, I think that's the way that you'd probably get to okay. that Thank kind you. of point. Thank you. Uh, Mr Northcote, do you have a view about the SSLN? Um, would, are you comfortable with the, with the suggestion that's been made, not just today, but in previous committee sessions as well, that that should be a, a, a changed, altered, enhanced in some way? I, th I think all I can do is make the obvious point that, that if you're in the position of the Scottish Government, given the advice it was given by the OECD, it was mm. probably going to be difficult for it to continue with the SSLN in its, in its, its form. The yeah. question is, what do you replace it yeah. with? I, I personally, I'm not sure I share the OECD's analysis. I think there were important strengths in, in, in the previous arrangement. Um, the S SNSAs, I guess, might be able to fulfil that function to some extent. But I'll go back to the point we made right at the outset you have to be clear what they are for. Mm. And at the moment, I don't think we are clear okay. what they are for. They're described as formative assessments and then they're described as summative assessments. And that is, as I say, that's a legitimate policy debate to be had, but you can't effectively try and get one assessment to fulfill both tasks. The other point I would make is that, in a sense, yes, it is important that national and local level policymakers have good information and data about what's happening in the education system, but they have to be able to interpret that data and information in context. And the danger always is that the data becomes everything. It becomes the only lens through which you look at the education system, and that's dangerous. And experience from elsewhere in the UK and other parts of the world underlines that many times, I would say. Okay, thank you. Lindsay Law, can I just ask you one question as a dad of a nine-year-old at a school in Scotland, um, uh, in terms of the information, and it's kind of the point that was made earlier on, I get more if I just ask a lot of direct questions than I ever do by reading the report. And I've looked at mine from, because my mum kept all mine as well, God help me, um, uh, from all those years ago as well. Uh, and I think we told, we told my, my parents' generation more than we tell parents today. What's your view about what needs to change about parental information 
um, from whatever system ultimately is going on in schools? I think that parents probably need to more information earlier about school and about the system of school in Scotland because it's fundamentally changed since we were at school. So you sort of arrive and there's lots of new terms and there's lots of words that you're sort of assaulted with. Yeah. And not every parent comes equipped to understand yeah. that. And not every parent, I loved school, um, but not every parent did. You know, for a lot of parents, going back to school and going through the doors of that school reminds them of an unpleasant experience of maybe, you know, those reports were very clear, but they were very clear that you were either succeeding or not. Yeah. And that's a very stark thing to tell a nine-year-old. Um, the great thing about the reports today is they tell you loads of things about what your children are doing in class, you know, how they're developing against these levels, whether they're secure, whether they're consolidating. It's not a pass or fail situation. But even those words, secure, consolidating, um, that's confusing for parents. So I think we you know, we need a, a, a system of education, uh, you know, an early years play-based um, curriculum that introduces children to school so they learn how to be at school, but also reintroduces parents back into school. Yeah. And, and, and really, we need to reconnect schools with communities. Mm -hmm. So we really shouldn't view schools as somewhere that children go to be given something by a teacher. We should view schools... In, in, in the context of their local community. We should be inviting industry into schools. We should be inviting young people out of schools into industry, into the local community. And only by doing that and by sharing with industry as well the meaning of curriculum for excellence, the terms in curriculum for excellence, will you start to bridge this gap of, well, you've got SQA results, but what do they actually mean? What does that do for you when you go into the adult world of work? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Colruth. And good morning to the panel. Um, I, I want to go back to the, the question of the SSLN. Um, Tavish Scott was, was following that line. Uh, and James McMenny, I know you, you spoke about having pupils that you taught previously do it. Um, I had pupils removed from my class as a modern studies teacher. And to be quite honest, that data meant nothing to me. It didn't obviously come to me. I, and actually, I felt pretty disempowered by, by the whole process. And I was quite taken by the EIS's written submission. I appreciate, Susan Quinn, you alluded earlier to the challenge around the SSLN. And you say that the EIS favours a proportionate gathering of data to provide appropriate system-wide information to inform policy making. So the SSLN was that. It sat at that level, it informed policy making. Um, is there not therefore an opportunity with the SNSAs to empower our classroom teachers to use data more effectively and also to track pupil progress? Because we've heard from previous evidence sessions that it does generate that information and it's able, that you're able more readily to use that information at a pupil level and at classroom level to track pupil progress right the way through a child's uh, educational journey. Not in the not in the, the manner that they're they're designed or 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 or, or, or are being used. Mm -hmm. And and as I said earlier, our members are telling us that they're not learning anything significantly new that they didn't already have from the other assessment work that they had they had done with yeah. the young people. So the tracking of progress does go on within schools. There will be Potentially, one of the, the challenges is that we have a, a multitude of tracking systems within schools across the country. But tracking of progress across the benchmarks and using the benchmarks and using the the E's and O's and the curriculum as a whole goes on on a on a daily basis, and and will have its trigger points around conversations w within schools so that teachers can use the information. To, to improve upon what they're doing next with them. Mm -hmm. I go back to uh, uh, what they're also not providing is, is the national picture in the way that you had from the SSLN. So they're doing neither of the things that, that, you, that we we're suggesting we, we would want for the system. So we have a system where there are a, a breadth of assessment strategies going on in schools that are working we needed to find some way for that to be um, collected nationally so that there could be a national picture around it. I think that this, the, ish, the, the data around the achieving a level provides that, albeit with the, the, 
the, the challenges that that faces in terms of time for moderation and the, the, the recognising of the um, understanding of the standards and whatever, and schools are getting better at that as it goes on. The SSLN provided something nationally that the SSNA are not going to provide. And whilst I understand, because I, again, I was the, the head teacher that removed the young people to administer them. I was the class teacher who had them removed from the class and didn't get in. And just because it didn't happen doesn't mean it couldn't happen in terms of what, what could have been used out of the SSLN. There, there were ways and means of, of using that information and there potentially, as James has outlined, ways of developing that um, so that you so that you get a, a really genuine a genuine picture of what where, where Scottish education is at a, a, a single point in time, but also with some of that really rich information that's below it around ar, around our young people and what we could be doing in terms of targeted interventions. Okay, can I, can I pick up then on Tavish Scott's line of questioning with regard to the reliability of the data prior to the SNSs? Because I was quite taken by what you said that EIS felt that it was reliable, it was efficient. And we know that I think 28 out of the 32 different local authorities use some form of standardised assessment prior to SNSs. But it was happening in very different ways. And I don't think that we're assured, and certainly from the evidence we've taken, that all of those assessments that were taking place were benchmarked against CFE, which is quite problematic, actually, mm -hmm. if you want to look at the reliability of the data. If we're not benchmarking what we're testing the kids with against the actual national curriculum, you know, what was the purpose of it? Um, so if we have greater standardisation then of what's happening at a local level, isn't there an opportunity to, to level the playing fields? Because at one of the previous evidence sessions we heard from, I think it was Professor Sue Ellis, who spoke about unethical assessment approaches. And she talked about taking, for example, groups of kids out of class and that being quite unfair. Therefore, if we have a standardised approach, isn't that a fairer system? have a standardised approach. The, 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 the SNSAs have not been introduced in a standardised manner. They, they, and, and the advice and the agreement from Scottish Government was that they wouldn't be introduced in a standardised manner what, because, sorry, they would be, that? It... because they would be used, they should be used by a local authority. Schools and teachers should be deciding when the young people are, are, are engaging with yeah. the standardised assessments. So they're not being used in a standardised way. They're being used differently in exactly the same way as the current raft of standardised assessments are being used in a variety of ways. And may we add, haven't been stopped in, in many local authorities with the SNSEs being introduced, even though that was one of the pieces of guidance that came forward, which was, as soon as we introduce these, you stop doing everything else. But all so, local authorities are now, well, under the SNSEs, they should be doing the same thing. And that's not what happened previously. So it is standardised. It, it's up to the teacher, you know, at what time in the year they want to carry out that assessment. That empowers the teacher, surely. But at least we know that what's happening in schools is, to some extent, standardised. And I have concerns that if we had 28 local authorities previously doing very many different things, that, that created a pretty unfair level playing field. You know, it wasn't fair to the children. And surely it should be in the children's best interest that they all have the same opportunity. And that's what this is about. But assessment isn't isn't an opportunity for a young person. It's about it should be about informing learning and teaching. Mm -hmm. And so as we've said, it actually doesn't necessarily it, the, the different standardized assessments were used in very different ways and for very different purposes. So some local authorities said they used them, but they didn't it wasn't a, a, an across the local authority. It was about individual schools determining what they used and when to inform the learning and teaching of the of for the young people in in their care and this won't this won't change that in my view because there still will be the 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 standardization the 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 reliability of the information you're going to have at around achieving a level is based on teachers professional judgment mm -hmm. this won't this won't change that or shouldn't change that unless you skew it to being simply about teachers professional judgment being whatever the scores and the doors are around the SNSA, which takes us all the way back to that then makes them a high stakes test. The fact is that the way that you get a, a, a standardised approach, a, a, a equitable approach across the country in terms of learning and teaching and assessment of learning and teaching 
is to look at the moderation practices that are going on and to look at how you are inspecting that to see that there are, the practices are, are, are equitable and that everybody is working to the same, the same standards. The SNSA won't fix that. It won't do that. It deals with 10% of the curriculum in a really narrow point in time. But any assessment deals with a narrow no, point. No, of but that's the whole point. It's a that's whole the nature of assessment. I mean, we're looking at a snapshot in time. It's not just to say that we're, that assessment but we're not, but data we're not is the looking only thing at, that a teacher yeah. would look at. They look at a broad range of different things that happen in their but classroom. But, but the whole point is we're not looking at a snapshot in time. The SNSAs are supposed to inform teachers' professional judgment. They're supposed to inform them when they come to have the conversations around. They're not about confirming teachers' professional judgment. That's the language that has been agreed around it. So they're only informing a tiny bit of the curriculum at a point in time, which isn't agreed will be one point in the year or one point elsewhere. The, 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 we'll, we'll, end up, we'll need to agree to disagree. I don't yeah. believe that these are going to add to the system that we have in place. And I don't believe they're going to deal with the issues you have around whether or not the evidence that's there in the system around achieving a level is more valid than any other. They, they, they potentially could be used in terms of those conversations, but there is no guarantees that they are going to make anything anything in those conversations any better the only way you're going to make those conversations better and understand whether or not um, those people that those young people who are being deemed to have been achieving a level is is genuine is, is if we train our teachers more effectively in in the moderation of that if we make sure that uh, senior managers and line managers and otherwise who are having those conversations are able to do so in a consistent manner so that there is a consistency of approach around the moderation of the achieving a level and as james says the understanding of those standards needs to be what's there the introduction of this, this test hasn't done that and won't do that. Thank you. It draws the focus away from that moderation exercise. Mr Northcote. Just quickly, I didn't want to lose that really important point that you made, because I think that is an important part of the story, is that before the SNSAs, 28 local authorities imposed standardised assessments on their schools. I think just one element of that to consider is that when you, I won't name any, but if you look at those standardised assessments, they were incredibly narrow, some of them. And I think it is an interesting contrast between that assessment and looking at the SNSA, which has some, I think, technically attractive features so it's an adaptive assessment for example it's got potential to be a better assessment than those it's replacing in 28 local authorities i think this does come back to the point though about if you have an assessment and it's a reasonably good standardized assessment that isn't the problem the problem is what are you going to do with the data that that standardized assessment generates and then if that's used for high stakes purposes you undermine the formative value that that assessment would have. But I think it's an important part of the narrative here that what's happened is that you've got rid of 28 different approaches to standardised assessment with one national approach. That creates challenges, there's no question about that. But we shouldn't pretend that there was no imposed standardised assessment in schools before. There was an awful lot of it. Uh, Miss Law, you wanted to come in? Um, I, I was just going to observe um, to the point around the standardised nature of it in the sense that teachers are supposed to administer it when they feel that the learners are ready, that in practice we're hearing from parents and teachers is not what's happening. So some in some local authorities that is happening, in some local authorities they are actually... Um, administering these tests in the same way they would have their own standardised tests in a set window, for example, in the summer term, so they've got that information for the transition year from P7 to S1. So it, it's not that the, the it, it's not being administered in a standard way across Scotland. Local authorities differ. Mr McEnany? Uh, it's essentially just sort of the form of that, but yeah, the, this kind of idea about, you know, we need to standardise something if you want to standardize something standardize the standards um not the not the, the way that you try to measure it one tiny little bit of the system it's I, I understand why it's attractive at government level i understand somebody who, so somebody who writes about scottish education in the media and is eternally frustrated but never been able to write the ten thousand words 
piece that he wants to do, you know, kind of thing. I understand why this kind of thing is attractive, but it's um, it's it's the sort of yeah, it's ultimately it's not just the the wrong road to go down, but it's always the same point about the opportunity cost. It's always that you spend so much time focusing on this this obsession or this need to think: can we standardise provision? Can we use this test to make sure everyone's getting the same kind of bit of data? And all the while, all we're doing is actually slipping further and further away from a situation where actually we've got a teaching and learning system in place which gives every single kid in Scotland the best possible chance in life. Okay, Ms Lamont. Yeah, thanks. thanks very much. I was wanting really to kind of focus on the, the practical elements of this. What is it appears to be standardised, but what strikes me is not even standardised in its purpose. Um, and I wondered if, if James McInerney would confirm really your own findings around your researches about where this all came from. Is it right, uh, is my understanding right that basically you start with the decision to have testing and then there's a kind of a post hoc rationalisation of it? Or is there any genuine evidence that somebody sat down and said this is an issue and took themselves to testing? Well, I mean, taking taking Susan Quinn's evidence already that, you know, during those the, the various meetings that there was nobody coming forward saying we want to see a new set of a new set of tests um, would certainly align with the kind of information that I've I've found looking at it. I would point out, of course, that it's very difficult to be sure because all of those meetings that took place were unminuted. Um, but I think it's um, it's quite easy to see. I think in the er at least in the very early stages of it that there is at least um, it's at least partly driven by a, a political decision. And I think there is certainly a, a, a significant element of it that looking at the available information, looking at the material that was there, looking at the, the scarcity of written advice, for example, that led to the implementation of the system, it was four emails, you know, given all of that, um, I can, you can un understand why people would come to the conclusion, sorry, would come to the conclusion that you've come to there, that was a decision made to start with testing and then everything proceeded from that. I wasn't in the room, I don't know, but... Um, there's not an awful lot of evidence that would show the alternative. And do you think that some of the confusion has come from a reluctance to pick a side in this argument? So you can argue there is a benefit from national testing. It's really rigorous and everybody has to understand that. Or you can say, no, it's actually it's diagnostic. It's about the individual child. And depending on your audience, you pick which of these you're going to emphasise. I mean, one of the things we've been told, certainly in our own debates, that it provides, you know, why would you not want to have a system that would identify a child's um, de developmental challenges or that, you know, there's a diagnosis that's just been missed? What's your... You, do you th I think... I think that... See, that actually, just... Sorry, but, see, but see, that point, this came up earlier on. This idea that these tests are going to be used to figure out children that have got dyslexia. I've, I've seen people talking about could these tests be used because they could help us identify autistic children in schools or kids with dyslexia and these kind of things. That is incredibly dangerous and really irresponsible because the tests absolutely will not do that. And any sort of thinking that that's going to happen, that these are going to be some sort of diagnostic for additional support needs, needs dealt with right now. That, that is absolutely not the case. We've got a bad enough situation in Scotland just now mm -hmm. with the way additional support needs has been treated over the last few years and we certainly don't need to make it any worse with this ongoing. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's one of these things, again, it's not an intentional thing. It's, it's not as if a minister has come forward and said, you know, these kind of tests will lead to kids with dyslexia being diagnosed early or anything like that. Well, but actually, this, 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 this line of thinking has, continu has continued and even if it's only through the, the omission of saying that is not that that's absolutely wrong, then it's I, I would regard that as being particularly irresponsible. I'm not. I'm not. I mean, I couldn't be absolutely certain, but my sense is that I, I, there has been an argument made back to those who've got concerns about the testing. Surely you don't want to be in a situation that a child with autism needs are not identified. That is actually right. Well, in that case, yeah, I, I would regard that. I would regard that as being very irresponsible. Okay, yeah. and I suppose the other thing. Well, two last points I want to make on the question of if you're going to do a standardised test, is is an issue. I've raised this um, in previous sessions, and I wonder if your views on this. I was advised by those who were presenting to us how the test worked that basically you could do it any time in the year, which would mean in primary one any time between a child being four and a half and a child being six. 
um, I was advised that you could rehearse with individual children and that the test could make no distinction in the information it then provides between a child who had to hear the word in order to identify the rhyme and a child who could read it. To what extent does that range of possibilities make the word standardised just nonsensical? Yeah, there was a, a, um, a point a couple of years ago that um, a government official, um, when the statisticians did an event, and, and sort of mentioned this and talked about how effective, I can't remember the exact words that were used, but I can, I can find it and I can provide it to the committee if, if necessary. I've got the video somewhere, it was recorded. Um, so I raised that point that, you know, all the tests being done at, at different points um, the data, the phrase that was used on more than one occasion was the data was not comparable. Now, of course, that's only an issue if you're going to try and use the data at a national level, um, which at that time was part of the was part of the conversation. Um, if it's pure, if it's strictly going to be formative information about each individual child, it's less important that I think that you know the data between one point in the year and later is not directly comparable because you're not using it for a for a comparison between two points. Um, but it does kind of speak to the, the confusion around the entire system that all those kind of issues are still kind of unresolved about it, certainly. Mm -hmm. We'll bring Ms Quinn and then Ms Law. Thanks. Yes. Just, just um, oh, on the point about the age range from four and a half to six, so overwhelmingly in the feedback that we got from parents and teachers, it was the primary one testing that was the, the major concern that teachers had and parents had. And, and that's because... P1s are engaging, should be engaging in a play-based curriculum. They're learning to be at school. They're learning how to be human. You know, they don't really know how to take a test. And, and not only is that hugely variable, you know, that it's a fifth of their lives difference between whether you do it at the start of the year or the end of the year, but also the feedback we were getting was in terms of resource time, and, and this time I do mean teacher's time, um, it was hugely costly. So you would have a class, you know, if you've got three P1 classes, the P1 classes would have three teachers. They would then have another three teachers taking children out one at a time alongside two support for learning and, and, and other assistants. You know, that is a huge number of resources and a huge amount of FTE teaching time on a test that is simply to gather a baseline and is not comparable because teachers can pick when to do it between the ages of four and a half and six. So in terms of whether or not um, the standardisation part is, is useful or, or otherwise, James is right, it, it kind of only really matters if you're gathering it for, for a national um, system or indeed if you are looking at using it in a way in local authorities. Um, that they use the current their, their, their current information, which means that what they're doing is they're separating out a standardised test from the overall picture of achieving a level and using that as a single, which is what we've had this conversation round and round the block around, is that if it is that you are singularly using standard a single standardised test to determine interventions or dare I say, league tables or otherwise, then it's a narrow approach and it leads, it leads to, to the road to ruin. If you use these assessments as part of the, the broader bank of assessments that a school is choosing to use, whether or not it's um, used in um, August, September, October or wherever within the school year doesn't matter because you're using it to inform your decisions and the evidence then will be set behind that around the, the moderation and the understanding of the standards in relation to that. But yeah, if it's if it's if we're looking at something more than um, what I understand its national use is around gathering information on the trends across year groups. Um, then there, there, there is a potential there is a potential difficulty um, for it. However, we would argue that that's not what we would, should be looking for within the system anyway, and we should be looking for something which gives us um, improved opportunities for our young people in our classrooms. Okay, so the, the issue about purpose is absolutely fundamental. Absolutely. And if you, were, if you weren't using it for national comparators, you wouldn't use that kind of test? Well, if you weren't using it for national comparators, a school would choose what they wanted to use for it. So again, I say, I was a primary head teacher. Um, my local authority have 
have indicated it's up to the school to determine when they need they, when they're going to use it within the the year that that they're, they're determined around. I would have always added into the the part of it the if so again you could then genuinely be using it as a diagnostic tool and you would be looking to see which individuals you were absolutely confident that your evidence that you already had showed that they were achieving the level and in which case you wouldn't waste their time or yours using an, an additional piece of assessment, an additional assessment tool for it. It would be used and it would be used genuinely as part of, of the assessment bank to, to inform teachers in relation to what they did. And as I say, in some cases, I would argue that you wouldn't need to use it at all because your body of evidence would show that they were achieving the level. James said, what does a, 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 a level three look like, right, a piece of writing look like? It will look like in a level two, a stage two level will be a primary seven's writing jotter that's yeah. that thick yeah, and on a collection yeah. of evidence and all sorts of things yeah. there that show that they're, achie they're, they're achieving all the bits and not necessarily backed up or, or in any way supported by the addition, need for addition. I think just a final point on that issue. Would you agree that a diagnostic test that can't make a distinction between a child who's been able to read the word and has had to listen to it and has had to learn to press the button to listen, that is not even a diagnostic tool because it's not giving you the information no, you've been looking for? Certainly, set out, certainly that, that came up earlier this week, and I think that is problematic in terms of how the teachers use the information that is generated um, that's, that's generated there. I also do think, and go back to the comments that are made, I think we need to be really clear about what we mean by a diagnostic test, because I think that there, 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 were, there were those who may well have got on board with the SNSAs because they, they understood it to be diagnostic, and but, but were misunderstanding what a, di what a single diagnostic test might do. Some would understand it, that it was about Diagnose, diagnostics within the parameters of the, the questions that were there, but others would certainly and, and very clearly um, felt that it was going to be somehow diagnosing other aspects of ESN, which they can't possibly do, and for which there are a wide range of diagnostic assessments currently used in schools alongside other partners in the health service and otherwise to make sure that our young people with additional support needs get their needs met. So my last question then is on this issue of opportunity cost. I think um, Lindsay Law has already sort of indicated some of that. I think it's a reasonable test to do a cost-benefit analysis. I would die be right in saying you think there's very little benefit, but the costs are quite significant. Have you been able to quantify that anecdotally um, amongst folk that I know who are still teaching? They tell me, 50 hours in a primary school round just delivering the assessment. A shift of, we've had some evidence of additional support for learning teachers being taken to do the test. Have you, I mean, I know that the EIS did a survey on it, but I wonder more broadly whether um, there is some kind of substantial evidence about what that actually looks like, because if there's little benefit to it, but there is significant cost, then it becomes more of an issue than simply, well, it's not, so some of that, it's not doing much harm either. So some of that's difficult to do because it, it, it's relying on infrastructure within schools. So members will tell us that if you are already in an advanced stage of um, ICT redevelopment and you've got iPads, then it takes less time to do than if you still have the old two computers in the back corner of the room or, or kids having to be extracted. What we do know is that a significant number of schools um, had their whole senior management team directed with for a for a two or a three week period of time doing do administering the assessments. We had reports of teachers who were giving up their known contact time and so therefore their employer technically being in breach of their, their their contract so that they could deliver them in the window that had been set by the, the local authority because of the, the structures within the school. And more worryingly, a good number of people suggesting that teachers who, or support workers who had been, uh, were being paid for out of PEF money, were being redirected to administer the assessments or to support the teachers in administering them in some way. And in which case, the money that's there to actually intervene in the poverty-related uh, gap were actually not engaged in the activities, the interventions or otherwise for that period of time, because the only way that 
the, the, the assessments could be delivered in the windows that were being set were, were to, to redirect staff in this way. Very conscious of time, and I still have one member who hasn't been able to come in yet. But if you could be maybe a little more concise in the answers, if possible, um, Mr. Northcote, I know you wanted to come in on that last. Just point. on the value for money point and the cost benefit, that that is really important. We know there are costs associated with SNSAs. It is difficult to say, well, what would the cost of the alternatives be? Um, but I think it's important to try and bear those in mind. So, for example, if the alternative to SNSAs was going back to the system we had before then one of the costs with that system was 28 local authorities each purchasing tests from different test providers. That's quite a substantial cost. If you were to replace SNSAs with some form of moderated teacher assessment, which would have its point, um, that could also be workload intensive as well. That could distract from other parts of the system. So I think if we want to think about the value for money element or the effective use of resource dimension of SNSAs, we have to think about what the costs of the alternatives would be when we decide whether this makes sense resource-wise or, or not. I suppose it may I may be very old, but when they did the sample testing, standardised testing in the schools I worked in, one person ran them. They put the you know you, you could do thirty kids at a time, so there wasn't this kind of working with a, an iPad type stuff, which I think has added problems. Optimal mark readers, all the rest of it, you know, they could be very straightforward in that sense. They're just not cheap to buy and local authorities had to buy them and um, they pay a full commercial rate for them. So they have a financial cost that, if that's the alternative to SNSAs, is going back to local authorities buying standardised tests and imposing them on schools, then we'd have to weigh that in the, in the balance. Can I just make up a point on that? And I don't have the figures to hand, but I remember initially one of the big defences of introducing the national system was that councils are spending money on standardised tests and this will save money. I am... This, the cost of, the, na of the, the, the national testing system increased a couple of times. I remember a particular kind of back and forth with the press office over it. Um, but I'm, sh I'm, sure, I'm sure Common Space has reported on it, for example. It should be easy enough to check. Um, I am not sure it is in fact the case that actually the amount the Scottish Government is spending is lower than the amount the councils were previously spending. It may be, but there is something in the back of my head that says that's something worth checking. Um, okay, budget, though. Just and to be sure of. Yeah, but just in the terms other of ones are coming if, you, if you're going to look at it as that kind of like straight opportunity cost, it's absolutely true. You'd have to look and say, right, well, what was the previous one? But there's sometimes in the way this has been framed, um, a kind of a quite maybe direct assumption. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's happened in the, the press as well. I would, I would sort of concede with that, obviously. Um, I think it would be worth, if you're going to look at this idea of the cost benefit side of things fully, then I think it would be worth looking to see even was that initial claim that the national system would cost less because that was the government made, yes it's two different budgets but the government made that claim so I think it would be worth checking to see is the amount of money the Scottish government is spending on this actually less than councils were spending just to be clear about that point it's just it's ringing a wee bell in my head just now. It's not really I need to move on. How much the script so. costs but actually what it means in terms of staffing. Yes, and then uh, the opportunity cost is much broader than just, just the individual money. It's just when, when that yeah. point got there, there was something in my head that's saying somebody or me should probably go and check that just to be so we've got a clear bit of data on that. OK. Uh, very patiently, Mr. Mandel, has been looking to come in. So. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think it's also just on that point, it's correct. Um, I think, um, but if, if I'm wrong, correct me, that not all local authorities have stopped purchasing other tests. That's correct. Um, and I think there's a I mean, I, I put the question to you really why, if the new assessments are so good, um, you know, have, have councils continued to, to spend money on, on something else? I think that's a fair councils, it's a fair, it's a fair question, but it, it certainly it would be for, for the councils. I, I would surmise that. One, they, they have argued that they, they, in the first year they are, were not confident of the, the new assessments and, and, and didn't want to give up what they had in terms of a uh, year's worth of data in their view. Um, some have also, we're, we're also in the position where they use standardised assessments every single year of a young person's time at primary school, so they're not giving up the in-between years. Others, dare I say, have introduced assessments on, beyond that um, in relation to PEF. 
because they've started to use assessments that they never used before to give them to paid for out of PEF money to give them a benchmark for the, the, the start of the PEF thing. So so there are there'll be a whole lot of reasons reasons why um, individual local authorities have have chosen not to, but it's absolutely clear that very, very few of them have gone, and certainly in the first year, with removing all the other standardised assessments at the same time as doing SNSE. Now, we hear that um, a good number of them are getting ready to, to do that as time goes on, but that time will tell on that. I, I think you'd probably expect there, during a period of transition, some degree of um, conservatism, if you like, about departing from a well-established system, whatever its shortcomings. But I think in the longer term, if we persist with SNSAs, those local authorities would need to be challenged because the point's been made earlier. One of the disadvantages of those systems is not only are they relatively expensive, they're also not at all aligned with curriculum for excellence. So it does question the value of local authorities spending public money on standardised tests that bear no relationship with the curriculum that schools are supposed to be pursuing. But maybe you can cut them a little bit of slack early on to say they needed some kind of um, period of, of support or transition um, to SNSAs. But in the longer term, it's probably going to be quite difficult to justify. Maybe the other point there is in terms of, say, PEF money and local authorities and schools having to be accountable for that, um, I think it's encouraging those to whom they are accountable to think carefully about the kind of indicators they want to use to make those those judgments, particularly indicators that aren't linked to curriculum for excellence. OK, thank you for that. The other question I wanted to ask was about transparency. Um, and I, I wonder, I, mean, I think I probably know what, what you'll say, but in, in terms of the development of policy, do you think it's, it, it's unhelpful you know, not to be transparent in those early stages and allow a broader Sort of conversation about the actual evidence base, you know, rather than presenting yeah, policies uh, and leaving journalists to. to well, yeah, you'll, the, you'll, you'll be shocked to hear me saying yes. I think transparency would be a good thing, um, but it, not just in the simple terms that yes, you know, obviously more information is likely to be a better thing, and, and less time spent for journalists, you know, chasing chasing everything, you know, trying to find any bit of useful information. Um, the the lack of transparency around the development of the standardised testing system fed into the way in which the testing system was then sort of had to be defended as the process went on, which has then made it quite difficult. I think part of the reason it's become very difficult to be clear about what the assessments are doing and what they're for is actually because all of that's all got, got bound up together. But I would argue it originates in things like spending a year in, in, you know, taking me all the way to the Information Commissioner to try and stop me releasing the fact that there were four emails that formed the entirety of the written advice the government had received before it. Um, I would always argue that in those sorts of situations that a government, if you're going to make the case that what you're trying to do is, in, in, is implement or introduce, I just wouldn't pose, but introduce a new policy that's supposed to be beneficial to this, the education system, and crucially, you're going to argue that it's something that is going to help teachers. These are big claims, and I think you need to be very, very, very clear about the evidence that you've got to support that and the process you went through to get to that stage. I would say in gen so yes, there needs to be more transparency, and this is actually a general point about policy formation, in which this policy um, forms a part of that. But in, in our experience of consulting, what usually happens is um, an idea is created, and then stakeholders from Scottish society are brought in to consult on that idea, because that is part of the consultation process. But the idea already exists, and so it sets up a naturally combative um, response between the people who are bringing the idea and the people who are saying, well, actually, have you thought about this and have you thought about that? You don't give much time to those people. And so it becomes an exercise in someone coming to defend an idea, people coming to knock it down, and actually that idea is still going through, leaving a whole load of stakeholders feeling somewhat disempowered and disenfranchised. So in, in general, I would say involve your stakeholders much earlier in the decisioning process, in the in the policy formation process and also look to understand root cause before you start to develop policy because this policy is 
strikes me as something that was developed to try to understand something, whereas it probably should have been done in reverse. So what are we trying to solve in the education system and how would we be best to solve it rather than looking straight to the measurement of something that we don't quite know yet what we want to solve or to measure? Thank you, Evan. Absolutely. I agree with that transparency in, in, in all ways. I think even worse in, in the case of this is the situation that we had a meeting where stakeholders were around a table. I mean, we're talking as big a table as this with all the seats filled with the then Cabinet Secretary for Education, where we discussed what was needed in terms of an understanding of uh, educational standards across the country. It was a generally agreed around that table that there was a wealth of information within the system and what we needed was something that would allow it to talk to each other so that there was a, a, a national a, a national understanding about it. We discussed whether there was a need for a, a national standardised test and, and the general viewpoint was that no, what was in place whilst maybe being uh, different from different places was what people were comfortable with, what people were happy with, that what we needed to find was a way to gather that information together. And then two weeks later, we attend an event where the First Minister announces that she's introducing standardised tests. Now, I, w I was at that meeting. I had been at the one before and I was sitting going, who? so where between that meeting and that meeting were any of the people around that table spoken to again around what was going to be decided and what was becoming policy? Because from my point of view, that then puts you on the, 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 the foot of, all right, OK, so you think so? And then we have to have the negotiations around what it's going to look like and, and everything else. And I think that was a real problem with the, the introduction of these, these um, tests was the, the, the manner in which it was done. Because there, was a, there appeared to be an engagement exercise taking place around the national improvement framework and the development of the database around that and the development of how we would report on national standards at that stage and point in time, there had been a discussion around what that might look like, and then something else comes from left field that's nothing at all to do with what the stakeholders and everybody was there were discussing. And obviously, just to add, um, from that, so when you, you go from that point, so if you take as the starting point, there have been these meetings where the people in those meetings said, well, we were there, and we all said that there was no need for this, and then we've ended up two weeks later having to watch the First Minister announce it's happening anyway. And then in that space, somebody like me comes along and tries to say, right, well, there should be material to look at them, we can figure out what happened. And it turns out there isn't any. It turns out there's a, I can't remember what it was. It was something like, there was a series of meetings, there was a number, it was something like, it was in the teens. And all there was for all of them were like agendas for three of them, you know? Um, and there's no written material. And now, don't get me wrong, it may well be the case that something is out there somewhere, but according to the FOI response that I received, it doesn't exist. Well, you know, what kind of conclusion do you expect people to draw when you're left in that sort of situation? And I think, you know, it's an entirely fair point that Lindsay's making. How do you, how does government expect stakeholder organisations to feel at the end of that process when you make a kind of, make the kind of point of right, come in and talk to us, have the conversations, get an answer that it seems that you don't really like, and two weeks later have apparently changed your mind? And there's nothing to it's, the, it's for me, it's then that there's nothing to show where that change where that change came from because there are some quite significant issues with transparency and policy making at sort of Scottish political level. No, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to follow up on two points from this morning as well. <clears throat> uh, one round uh, training for teachers um, and just whether there was enough training um, in advance of the, the, the SNA essays coming in uh, to, to help people understand the, the data they were producing and whether the, the training that was there was actually accessible to, to classroom teachers? The difficulty with it was that the, the timings of it, so teachers um, training is, is generally, if it's a, if it's a hufty as we, we call it, if it's something that everybody has to do within a school or, or you as an individual has to do within a school, needs to be part of your working time agreement or your in-service days. The timings of when the training became available by Scholar and, and Acer meant that that couldn't hap wasn't getting put into working time agreements for the, the, for the first year of the assessments, which meant renegotiations had to take place around how people could get 
out for training and, and beyond. And so there were challenges in certain local authorities and local areas around people being released. Given the shortage of supply teachers across parts of the country, it becomes difficult for people to get to the, the training. The message around whether or not the, the, of the quality of the training, again, within our, our submissions, is, is mixed. You know, the, the, the actual how you do it was fairly straightforward, but then there was a gap in time before the, um, the, the, digi the, the data literacy um, was, was taking place. And again, in some cases, that would be that it would be a senior manager who would attend the training and then um, cascade the information and that in and of itself can always bring um, a dilution of understanding of, of what's there. So it, it, if there had been a period of time in, in which the assessments were being developed and prepared and people being trained in the implementation of them before the session started that they were to be implemented in, then you would have been in a much better position. But it was, and that's why in some local authorities, the windows were left until the, the very end of the, the summer term because teachers hadn't received the training and they couldn't receive the training because the, the training group could only deliver a, a, you know, a quantity at a particular point in time. So we would attest again, if you're introducing a policy, you need to actually have the resource behind it. You train people, not just as the day before they're about to use it, but in good enough time that they can digest and ask the questions and become really familiar with it and then introduce the, the, the system. Thank you. Thank you. And then final question. Uh, there was also a suggestion um, this morning that up to uh, 25 uh, local authorities are sort of mandating a window um, in which the tests uh, can take place. Uh, wh wh why would they be doing that if it is in fact for, for, for teachers to decide and to, to look at when individuals are ready to, to sit those tests? Because they want to continue with the model of um, practice that they have already in place. They want to, they want to continue to use the um, test data in isolation from other assessment practices to, to, to do whatever it is they do to inform their local politicians in nice graphs around a particular thing, to overcome the fact that it's not a standardised test in the way that people understand a standardised test unless it's done in a particular... They'll have all sorts of reasons to do it. But. And do you think that increases the, the stakes? You, know, do you can talk yes. about tests mm -hmm. Absolutely. As, low, as low stakes, or do you think they then become medium or high stakes? I think if, they, they certainly the, the, the stakes are... increase as, as local authorities because what you have are um, things that can be FOI'd or gathered by journalists in order to create uh, league tables around schools and, and the like that was never never the intention and in fairness to, to government when we were in the discussions around it was what they tried to tried to avoid by not gathering the, standard, the, the national assessment data at, at national level uh, by, only ha by only gathering the, the high level stuff around the trains. That prohibits that, but by having windows of opportunity for testing at local authority level, all it does is means that there will be local um, there will be local league tables and that and then in itself leads to the challenges that we raised right from the start, right from the outset around it, that we should be focusing on the bigger picture, the whole thing, not just this wee tiny test. Can I, can I just add something there? Yeah, it, it just gives pops back into my head there. This, this thing about um, local authorities and um, giving sort of windows that um, thing I mentioned before the event where one of the government officials had been talking about different aspects of the testing, I'm um, sure it was at Hamden. One of the, again, I'll, I'll go and check this for the committee and I'll, I'll resubmit something for you and check just to make sure it's absolutely accurate. But I'm sure there was part of the discussion for which I have the transcript, there was a point at which it seemed quite clear that what they were talking about as statisticians was that even at that stage, there was an expectation that over time, the tests would start to be done in relatively set windows, whether or not it was ever set out as a, as a policy intention. There seemed to have been an expectation that, you know, ultimately, this is where it will end up. Um, and as I say, I'll, I'll check the exact transcript for you, but I'm pretty confident about, about that one. I'll make sure. Ms Law? 
My understanding that a number of local authorities use standardised testing at the end of P7 to form part of the information that the cluster primary school would send to their local high school. So it would be logical to assume that if local authorities are no longer allowed or are trying to reduce their spend on standardised testing because um, this one takes place in P7, it would be logical to assume that they would prefer it would be done in the window, a standard window, to gather that data for high schools and high schools would prefer the same. But th that's my assumption. Okay. Oh, Mr. Northcote. I'm just gonna say very briefly, if I'm a teacher in a school, in a local authority, where the um, assessment window has been imposed on my school, and the assessment window is very narrow, I'm going to be very skeptical about claims that this is a formative assessment to help me make professional judgments about the children I teach. So it doesn't help this lack of clarity about what these assessments are actually supposed to be for. Okay, um, thank you very much. And uh, can I, I thank all of those who have given evidence at the committee today. It's been a very long session. Um, we're about to go into private session. I wouldn't normally do this, but if you could leave the room quickly, because we've got an early start in chamber this afternoon, which is unusual for members that will let us continue straight into a private session. Thank you very much. <laughs>